Let's talk about op optimization. Um, so first of all, I have a very strong name, very strange name. So people call me Joe, uh, or Joe Hawk, that's a new thing. That's me. Uh, I kind of live in New York. At the same time, I don't really live in New York. Uh, it's been half a year, I'm actually literally homeless. So if you're interested in any of that, you can check me out right here. Um, as a job, I think I'm probably best described as a professional idiot. Uh, I just usually break things and then try to fix them. Um, uh, in, the thing I do every day is I try to grow businesses using technologies. And the reason I'm giving you this talk is that as you grow um, certain pieces of technology quite large, you kind of have to measure them. Uh, I, was, I was in the US uh, actually up to Thursday. Uh, and last week I was driving this car. Does anyone know what it is? Yes. Fucking amazing. <laughs> like, I had this. Fire. Cart. <laughs> I'll do it again. So, this is a Tesla Model S, the latest Tesla car. Probably the only properly built electric car out there. Like, Prius is a horrible car. If you're driving a Prius, you probably want to leave this room. Because I, like, I don't like Prius drivers. Um, so, this is a Tesla. It's actually like. This is the performance version. I drove this, and it, like, it goes like a train. It just pulls straight up. But what happened recently is New York Times published this article. And what we did is we wrote, actually, it's pretty shit. Um, and how we tested that is we took the car for a drive, went across the East Coast in the US from, from New York somewhere to, all the way to Delaware, um, and kind of documented that, did a time log, wrote about how it's actually terrible at mileage and all those things. And everyone kind of said, wait a second, but actually Tesla should be pretty good. Like everyone's saying Tesla is a very good guy. Why, why New York Times is claiming that it's actually bad? Um, Elon Musk, the, the founder and the CEO of Tesla, obviously kind of were in a position to defend that. So why it failed? Like why the New York Times driver, when he drove that car, which is very, very cool and very, very fast and it lasts forever, it does like 300 miles easily on one charge, why it failed? Um, the only way for them to defend the, uh, their position uh, was to base it on data. Uh, it's, it's like going back, <laughs> talking about cars, it's very common in a car industry to give uh, specifically prepared cars uh, for car testers. So for example, uh, manufacturers like Ferrari would give you a car, but with usually 100 more horsepower than a production car, and they actually would bring that car to a test track before you test it, tune it properly, make sure it works on that track and then give it to you to test. So obviously it's fake. Um, what Tesla do after the Top Gear review, because Top Gear did a review a year ago uh, of a roadster and they kind of claim that it only lasts like 50 miles. After that, uh, actually Tesla sued Top Gear and actually won and kind of t uh, BBC apologized for that. But what, the, what Tesla do now is actually they record every single thing about the car when they give it to, to people to test. So what happens is, after that article, they, they graphed, this is the distance traveled, and this is the average speed. And these are the like a bunch of facts the article claimed, and why they're wrong. So for example, one of the facts was like, oh, I actually drove at 45 miles an hour, and the data, the data says that actually it was never 45 miles an hour, it was always faster. And it talks about different, different speeds. Another thing is, the article was claiming that they, uh, they actually recharged the car a few times, but the data shows that they actually never did that. They never went to a supercharging station and, uh, and reached 100% of charge. They only charged for a while. So obviously there's something fishing going on. There's obviously something wrong. Uh, another thing is uh, the driver actually went to a parking lot and just did circles in it just to try to kill the battery, as it shows from this. Like, he drove like 0 0.6 miles at a speed of 10 miles an hour. So he was just driving in circles. So what happens is that data doesn't lie. Um, what Tesla was doing is they were collecting metrics every, sing every second, about every, like, every part of the, of the car, the charge level, the speed, the position of the car. So when New York Times claimed that it's actually a bad car, we were like, wait a second, we have actual proof that it's not true, because we, call we know this, it's data. So if data says it's zero, it's zero. Like there's there's no subjective in that. And people like people are pe people are idiots for a lot of reasons. One of them is they make subjective decisions. So the guy obviously driving the car was like, well, 
I don't really know what I'm doing, maybe I don't even know what cars do, and I'm just like not gonna charge it and then claim I charged it. So it's obviously wrong. Uh, debugging in production. So what the, what the, the reason I'm talking about Tesla is what we were doing is we're debugging the car in production. So all the software running the car was already in production. Like it, it wasn't a development environment, but still we were debugging the car. They were collecting data they can use to debug the stories. So when a, a journalist claims something, they can go back and say, wait a second, like you're wrong because we know it's not right. So um, have any of you went to one of the Facebook development talks? I think it was at the PHP UK last year. And how we do things, how we deploy in Facebook, they would actually um, take their code once, once it's ready for production and deploy to a certain list of servers first and then grow, obviously grow, eventually deploy to all of them. But the point of deploying to a smaller set of servers is that actually once we deploy it, they look at how the behavior changes of all sorts of different metrics. For example, if you deploy a certain patch to Facebook and all of a sudden people went from uploading 100 million pictures an hour to 1 million pictures an hour, probably there's something wrong. It's very likely that the behavior of your users is always consistent. And as you grow to the size of Facebook, at that size, it's, it's, very, like, it's very likely that if something changes drastically, there's something wrong. Uh, like currently, I mainly work with e-commerce systems, and we would usually get a uh, couple thousand orders uh, per hour. If all of a sudden my metrics say that we didn't have any orders in an hour, probably we broke something. Like it doesn't just doesn't happen, unless the whole U.S. exploded, which is not going to happen. Russians are safe now. <laughs> uh, but the problem is actually I, I had this a lot. Of, like usually when something breaks in, in the work, the place I work for, it's usually my fault. And what I notice is that a lot in a lot of cases when things break at that kind of behavioral level, it's very hard to notice them. Deploying your code, everything works. No PHP errors, no nothing. But all of a sudden, your users are not using our application. What like what happened? Um, and that's the question. What happened? Like <laughs> so this and the. PHP penis uh, t-shirts don't go well, I think. He's hiding his PHP penis. <coughs> so what happened? To realize, what, like, to, 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 to figure out what happened with your application, you need to know the current state, what's happening right now, and what happened in the events before that. And there are certain, there are certain different ways to do that. You can actually just test your application in live. You can just go to your website, log in, click around, the f like, click about, see what's happening. Maybe that's going to work. But the importance is the only way to actually know what's happening is actually you need to correlate different events. For example, your network traffic, the amount of PHP errors, and things like that. So I have an example of that. Um, so this is, um, this is a graph of PHP warnings in my application, and it's a time series. So as the time goes to the right, uh, all of a sudden there is more errors. If this happens in your application, you're like, well, probably developer broke something. Let's, let's try to figure out why and how. How are you going to do that? It's hard because clearly you did something, you then fixed it, so the problem is, doesn't even exist in the code level maybe anymore, but something happened. So what you need to do is, for example, correlate the data with deployments. So here I see I did a deployment just after 4 p.m. and clearly it caused the application to go to berserker mode with errors, and then I fixed it something was still happening and I fixed it again. And now I know it works fine. In other cases, um, this, is, this is again deployments. Uh, these are successful logins and these are unsuccessful logins. Cle like, from, like from this data, just as a human person, I can clearly tell my deployments are not affecting logins. So that's a good thing. Because say if after this deployment, the error rate, the, the, the darker color all of a sudden spikes, again, I broke something because if you look back at the data, it's always at the stable level. Uh, another graph from Etsy. So we did a few deployments right here. One deployment, another, another. And right here, actually, we released a new feature. This orange bit is the, the support request at the help forum. The red bit is the help request in bugs forum. So clearly, after deploying this feature, no one is complaining about bugs, they're actually excited about the functionality and actually question, asking questions how to use it right. So it's a good thing. Like how can you express these sort of 
questions how you can express these sort of data correlations without actually logging them. Developers usually log things, and logs suck. Let me explain why. It's very, it's very easy to cre create a log, like any framework, any library, any application provides logging functionality. And there's even a PS PSR standard for logging now. Logs are useless because someone needs to read them. And if you're writing a lot of data to a log, who's going to read that? Probably no one. So when something, something breaks, you're going to go back to the server, try to grab it, try to look for information, and hopefully figure something out. Good luck with that. Another problem is if you have two servers or have a bunch of different servers, MySQL server, application server, mem memcache server, they all have their different log files. You need to aggregate them somehow. You need to do those connections I was showing before because otherwise you just have completely unrelated dumps of data. Uh, again, the problem is that when you write a log file, it, it blocks the application because you need to write a file. So if you're doing a lot of writes, the application becomes slower. It's a very, very big problem. My, like, people think I don't sleep, and actually it's not true. I really want to sleep, and I ca sometimes I can't sleep because I, I'm not sure if the applications we are working on are actually working. When you go from log files to use, actually use metrics, you can sleep, pretty much. If, you, if you're having sleep problems, it's going to fix it. Um, when things go wrong, metrics will tell you why they're wrong usually, if you're doing things right. Second of all, you can set up automatic alerts where if I'm giving, if this graph is more than a thousand of something per second, call me or send me a text message. And so like right now, to my phone, I will get text messages every time a certain application breaks. And I think it's very good because it, it, it means I do not need to be checking anything. And that's a very important thing because when, when you deploy an application and you think it's going to break, you kind of keep checking the logs, keep checking all sorts of things, keep checking what users are doing. You really don't need to do that. You can just rely on the, on the metrics to tell you that. Um, and obviously, when, when things break, when certain small bits break, they don't break silently. Like, uh, I think last week ago, we had this problem where a cron script would stop uh, stopped working because the log file it was trying to use had wrong permissions. Like, how are you going to detect that? Are you going to check every single log file, every single script it runs, every time it runs, if it's actually running correctly? You couldn't. But because we were actually logging, we, uh, we had metrics every time a script would run and a certain data it would generate, we knew it was working. So, business problems. Um, it's, it's, I think it's, it's very good when, when all your problems actually rely on a code level. In the, the bigger problem is, is when the problems rely on a business logic level. Because when business tools stop working, like your orders stop importing, or the rate of orders stop importing is wrong, or the users are not using application, it's very hard to figure out why exactly is it happening when you only have your application source code, or you don't have access to log files. Like, how are you going to do that? So what we are trying to do is give developers a way to easily get reminded when things are broken. So you need to count things and time them. How to do that? Counting obviously means sending or incrementing a, a, a certain variable with a certain timestamp. So you know, in this time range, in an hour, in five minutes, in, in a day, that's the amount of things which happened. And another thing is you need to time things. So every time something runs, you need to know how long it took. It's once, like once you combine that, once you know how, how much things are running and how long they take, you, like you know when things break. Because if the graph of things running drops, obviously something is broken. So I have a solution, it's called StatsD. Measure all the things. Um, it's extremely, it's extremely a small library or a system component. It was actually written by Etsy. So Etsy is, 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 a, is an American uh, e-commerce platform, portal, marketplace thing, uh, run from Brooklyn. Like the capital of hipsters, um, it's a, it's a Node.js server, which sits on your server, and it collects metrics. So from from your application, you send metrics to StatsD uh, using UDP protocol, and that's very important because it doesn't block. So if you have a closed loop where you just look for things and you want to measure how long every single iteration takes, and you don't want to block your application runtime, you can keep sending things to StatsD. 
maybe they will fail to reach it because also like all sorts of reasons can happen. Your network, like kernel level network bugs. But because it uses UDP, which doesn't require an acknowledgement, it will just keep writing to that and eventually it might reach stats D. So it's very, very simple and it just works. So there's an example. Um, it has obviously a PHP library. So you can just do stats D increment PHP UK visitors. So that's just like a, a certain variable name I chose. And what this does, it's actually, it actually sends a value with this name with a value of one, because like you increment by one, and a timestamp. Once you, once you like keep incrementing things, then you can graph them. Another thing is, you can time things. So you can start running things, uh, it, it take an initial timestamp, run a function, figure out how long it took, and then just store it as a timing information. And what, what, what statsd does, is actually it, it, contain, it collects those um, messages from the application, or from a server, because your server can also keep sending stuff. And with UDP packets, they reach stats D. And that's the, that's the initial step, where your application now keeps sending messages and keeps sending those metric information. Once you do that, once you do that, you obviously now need to plot them. So you, there is another library called Graphite. <coughs> this one is not written by Etsy. Uh, I, don't, I don't even know who wrote that? And all, like all of these things are obviously open source. What Graphite does is it takes the data from statsd, pulls it in, and and graphs it for you. Um, so that's just an example of the interface. Like it, you can use, you can just connect to Graphite for a terminal, so you can actually graph few things in a terminal, or you can do a, a default web interface. And it has a pretty nice API, so you can integrate all those graphs to your application. So like if you have already a backend system whatever you're using, you can just integrate them. So what Graphite does is, first of all, real-time charts, any, like any metrics you send, any time series you send, it keeps graphing them. So as the time moves on, it adds the new points you just added. It collects the data you sent to that, it aggregates that. So uh, usually when you, when you plot time series data, you wanna know not necessarily every single value, but usually the, what is the value of 75% of the events it got, or what's the value of 100% of events, or something like that. So what Graphite does, it actually collects the data and stores in a specific database. The point of, the, the reason why Graphite has its own database, it's because it needs to store a time series data. So it just says, I have uh, enough storage to store, for example, an hour of data, and you configure that. And then it just rotates the, the database. So as you write new things, the old things disappear, because usually, when you're, when you're talking about metrics, you don't really need to know what happened a week ago. Usually it's enough just to know what's happening right now. So it's, it's, a, very, it's a very tiny thing. So what happens is your application, your server, write things to statsd, and once in a while, usually once a minute by, by default, Graphite pulls them in, uh, stores them, and then the dashboard displays them. So all of a sudden, you went from not having any metrics to actually storing them to store in time, time data and also displaying it. Um, another tool, another pretty cool library, it's called Lobster. Actually, it's not called Lobster, it's called Lobster. But <laughs> I just like to imagine it's called Lobster. I don't know, I, I, everyone I know calls it Lobster, so I just, like, I just assume it's Lobster. What, what Lobster does, what Lobster does, <laughs> is it parses log files. So if you have existing applications, if, for example, Apache, or your application already is writing to log files, it can just parse them and ship them to Graphite. So you can go from just having normal, graph, gra, normal uh, log files to actually graph file, log files being used to graph for graphs. And obviously Graphite doesn't, like, doesn't depend on one server. It can, it can get the data from any servers you have. It can uh, run on any servers you have, so it's not a problem. Uh, so Luxor is pretty cool. It's, again, uh, written by Etsy, a very small library, a very cool library, and it just parses any log files you want uh, in real time and pushes the data to Graphite, so you can graph it. Uh, out of these tools, uh, we are kind of only using StatsD because for graphing, you use a, a managed solution called Datadog. Um, it's, it's, it's very similar to New Relic, if you have used that. It's just cheaper by a factor of one, which is quite a lot. Uh, so Datadog is pretty much a, a managed solution of Graphite. And it looks kind of like that. It's not like the, the graphs right here are not really important. But basically, you add any amount of uh, graphs and you store them. 
So what the Datadog does is, instead of you having to run Graphite or instead of you having to care about where those metrics are going to live, you actually just subscribe to that, add one little tiny library in your server, which takes the data from StatsD and pushes that to Datadog servers, and everything is live. Uh, it, takes, it takes care of aggregation and storage for you, so you didn't really need to worry about that. And it also allows you to do anything you want. So imagine you have five different metrics, like user logins, orders, server errors, PHP errors, PHP warnings, all of that. You just do new graph, use this data, use an average of this data, and it just provides you a time series of what happened, what's happening right now. And obviously, it's all real time. So whatever is happening on your server, everything's immediately visible. Uh, so I have an example. Um, so that's actually, so Datadog suffered an Amazon uh, outage, uh, which was, I think, a couple months ago. And actually, they wrote, they wrote a blog post explaining why it happened. The reason why they, know, why they know how it happened and why it happened is because they use metrics. So this graph shows the uh, elastic uh, storage on Amazon uh, um, wait times. So all of a sudden, something spikes. Obviously, there's something fishy going on. What happens next is, at some point, their load just skyrockets to 47, which again, something, something is clearly not right. And then finally, uh, their web page views at some point just drop to almost zero, then like, kind of float around there for a while, and once they fix things, they, they rise again. So we have three different graphs. Uh, you put them uh, close, to, close to another, and not, that tells you why that application was failing. Like immediately you know why it was failing. Because first of all, uh, I think it's not aligned necessarily perfectly. So first of all, there was a EB, uh, disk problems. So the, the writes, any write the system, the server was doing, was just failing. Then second of all, the, the load spike. So these are both server metrics. And then their application metric was saying, oh, actually, like we lost so many users. Obviously, something is going wrong. So it's very easy at this point just to create an alert saying, if the user count is if the user amount is lower than this, because as you can tell, it's pretty stable. If it's lower than this, send me a text message and I'll be able to fix it. So like so far, no questions? No. Um, so how do I use it? Uh, so look, I, I think I've been using Datadog for a, about a year, and it's proving to work very, very well. Um, the, the I think the coolest project I work on, and the, the example I want to use is about web spiders. So web spider is something that Google would build, and a, a bunch of other companies. I, I build them too, uh, mainly. So currently we have roughly 250 nodes in the web, web, uh, web spider cluster. And our goal was always how we can make it so the, the amount it takes to process any pages is as small as possible, and we can do as many requests as we can and at that time, we were doing a couple thousand requests a second through, for a combined cluster. And second, of goal, second goal was how we can make sure or how we can know that everything is working reliably. reliably. So if there are network issues, we are kind of notified about them well in advance. And that's why we went with uh, using Datadog for this. And we, we plotted request times, HTTP error rates, proxy errors, uh, error types and all sorts of unknown responses. So if you were to request uh, a, a web page and we're getting something we don't understand, probably there's something wrong. Maybe our proxies are failing, maybe the Amazon network is failing, and we had that. Uh, once once uh, when building a similar pro pro project, uh, we kind of accidentally la launched a DDoS attack on Amazon.com, uh, and they called me on the phone because we were, we were also running that from Amazon Web Services. So we kind of, wait a second, there's, like, there's traffic coming from our own servers, DDoSing Amazon.com. So they called me, kind of with a very angry voice, and said, you better shut it down. And we kind of, at first we were like, no, we just keep running. So we actually, we just limited the network traffic of the whole account to like one kilobyte a second. And <laughs> which, is, which is really not cool when you have also production servers running on the same account. So everything, and then, and then he called them back and like we figured it out. Uh, I was, I just used my kind of semi-Russian accent and we like, we were like, yo, wait. Um, <laughs> please don't kill us. Um, so 
we spent roughly three months in the kind of development and pre-development stages. And in that time, we increased our performance roughly 10 times. And the stability, and then we reached a stability of roughly like nothing ever breaks anymore. And how we did that is that we, we plot um, the request times and the amount of messages in a queue. So we use Girman for queuing. So we queue a certain list of pages we want to uh, gather the data from. And we monitor that. So as long as the queue is always decreasing when they add new elements, obviously it's working right. And when, as long as it's never kind of maxing out and just keeps climbing, we know we are processing fast enough so that the new items added don't decrease the performance. And I have, a, I have a different talk which only talks about data mining. And like PHP is, I guess, not necessarily an ideal solution for these sort of problems. Because doing a lot of requests from PHP is very, it just, it's, just, it's not easy. And the biggest problem is that most of, the, uh, most of the libraries, like using sockets, for example, just doesn't reuse connections well. So if you start doing a lot of connections, you just max out your Linux kernel level connection amount, which is 56,000, I think. Uh, so we actually ended up using curl multiget. But like the coolest thing is that you, we would work on something and we're kind of trying to figure out how exactly we can make sure that we are doing as many requests as possible, everything working as fast as possible. You commit something, you deploy, we kind of graph a deployment line, and all of a sudden, your request time drops. And it's like the, <laughs> it's the best feeling ever. Uh, okay, maybe not the best feeling ever. No, <laughs> no. I didn't say that. You're just imagining things. Um, and after we did that, we can actually sleep now because the, everything, we, everything we, we collect the metrics, the metrics for and we know, we know it's working fine. But, and then we set up alerts for the lower bound and upper bound. If a request takes more than a, 100 milliseconds, we, I get a text message saying there's something wrong happening because it usually takes like 10 milliseconds. And sometimes things would get stuck. For example, we had all sorts of problems like Gearman workers just getting stuck and you have a when you have a lot of them running, then they start randomly getting stuck. It's very hard to debug that. As I was saying before, like when things break in production, you're like, what, why, why, like why it's not working? Because you would go to the interface, your admin interface, your front end application, and everything seems to be working, but the performance you're getting is just not right. So once you add metrics for that, once we know that, wait a second, actually every time we add a thousand uh, messages to the Gearman queue, they actually get cleared up pretty quickly and they don't take more time than they should be taking. Everything is working fine and I can sleep. So wrapping up, I think I actually sp spoke way too quickly. <laughs> you, like, you have to ask me a lot of questions. Not about like, the best feelings and stuff. Uh, so wrapping up. So measure things. <laughs> Like there's so many like possible angles to take to, to look at this. Um, yes. Uh, so you need to measure things. So like when when you deploy applications, when you run applications, when you're when you're dealing with actual applications running in production, you need to measure their performance at the really low level. So the advantage of using StatsD, for example, for that uh, for that as opposed to any other way, is that first of all it doesn't slow down your applications. So like your any page and have like 50, 100, 1,000, a million, a billion, a, a, a trillion uh, metrics and it doesn't slow down your application. So that's very important because then, then you as a developer can choose to add metrics and make sure that your, your I know, sysadmins or, or people who manage your application are happy because like you add them for yourself and application is not slower from them. So that's good. Because with StatsD, you, like it, the, the line one was showing, uh, stats D increment, that's the, only need, that, that's the only thing you need to add to your application. Obviously, uh, after you include the library, you don't need to configure those message names, you don't need to do anything. Like any name you choose, you just commit that, you start pushing those um, metrics, and all of a sudden you, you're able to graph them with any tool you chose, both either Graphite or the Datadoc uh, HQ. If you're not graphing them, obviously, they're kind of useless. And that's the same thing about log files. Like if, if you just log things and you never look at them, don't even log them because you're just wasting this space for no reason whatsoever. It's very important when talking about data and talking about how to use the data for problems is that you, have, you actually have to be using it as opposed to just 
storing it just because you might need something. Because, oh, another reason why log files suck is that log files are usually rotating very quickly. Uh, so, uh, uh, like if you have a lot of visitors and you're trying to log Apache requests, I don't know, maybe you will store like an hour of data and after that, gone. And if you had someone calls you and says, like 6 a.m. in the morning today, today, our clients were complaining that something was not, not, fu not functioning right, your log files are just not there anymore. So, measure things. Uh, use StatsD to collect the data. So, don't, like, don't try to even like, store things in, mem in databases or log files. It's not going to work. Use StatsD, best thing ever. Uh, when, you store, like, when you push data to them, use Graphi to graph that. And then, when you outgrow that, just use Datadog or New Relic to kind of provide a huge hosted uh, solution. Because like for us, when, you ha like when we had a lot of servers, uh, you, uh, you need storage for that. So obviously, like when you're running Graphite locally, it needs a very massive disk just to store every single metric we would send, because we would send millions of those during a, an hour. And then you can sleep. So thanks for your time. If you have any more questions, no, if you have qu any questions, you should ask them. You mentioned StatsD. Uh, yes. I went to these DevOps conferences where they mentioned uh, CollectD. Have you worked? I haven't used that. I don't know. And what is it? Uh, similar, it collects data, stores it in a central server. Works well with Graphite. Apparently, I haven't tried. I think it, it like so. StatsD has like 55 clo uh, forks. It might just be that. Maybe. What's What's the language it's written? No clue. You know, well, that's uh, why I ask. StatsD is written. Tell me. Says this written in uh, Node.js, and there's like a few, f uh, a few forks who rewrote that in Python, in the thing in Scala, and a few other languages just to play around. So I think CollectD just might be one of those forks. And while I have the mic, Logstash, what's your opinion about that tool? I, I hate log files. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to put it out there. No, I don't, like, don't log. I don't, I don't, no. We don't use log files at all. Any more questions? Yes. Um, can you sorry, uh, can Apache log straight to StatsD, um, or does it have to still do it through the log file and use some of the logs? So the easier the, the easiest way would be to, to use the logs, logster <laughs> logster uh, so I showed before. So you're still logging to a log file though. You can't bypass the log file. For some things, yes. Like uh, you can. I, I don't think there is an existing plugin for Apache which would kind of change that. Yeah. But so but, but you can pipe things from Apache log file using the lo lo Logster to Graphite, so it kind of solves the problem. Yes, the question right there. Is the yes, hi. Is there a way to uh, aggregate without using uh, the dog <laughs> website? Data dog? Graphite also aggregates. Uh, yes, you okay. Basically, you, you, you can configure usually before. So Graphite has a bunch of configuration files. One of them, you can pre-configure how it should aggregate the data. and. But actually, as far as graphing goes, you can, you can graph multiple data series just by, by default out of the box. It's only when, if you want to do like multiply values, do averages, do sums and stuff, then you can probably pre-configure that before that. Because it, then it would, as you write to that, it would aggregate that and then write it immediately to the right format. Yes. This was a very German wave, like, <laughs> salute. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Would you not say some of the problems you pointed out with logs, such as losing some data, is more due to a crappy implementation of logging than it is a problem with logging? And what is the right way implementation of logging? Well, not erasing data after an hour, for example. So just because you rotate a log doesn't mean you have to then be like, oh, well, this has gone forever. But then, and it's like, very handy if you're a developer to have an actual error message. Yeah, but then you need a massive, uh, massive di disk to just to fit all those logs. Well, not as, like... Uh, like they, they store yes, but I mean, lo like logging is fine, but you, don't, you, you won't probably keep those logs for like a week long. Sorry? Would you keep a log after a week? Yeah, we, we definitely do keep logs for a while. Okay, we don't. <laughs> 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 yes. It's quite easy compared to setting up a different system. Well, uh, yes, I, I, I agree that's easier to log, but at the same time, I think it's very... Like it's space inefficient to log files. Um, can you see that there being um, kind of complementary aspects to this? So um, the kind of things you're talking about will tell you 
uh, very quickly when things are going wrong. Yes. But your logs can tell you what has happened, what that error message is, what where you should be looking. I mean, that's you, true. you can see that you, that you have a drop off in users, and you can see that something's gone wrong, but. Yeah, the but metrics so don't really tell you what I'll, has actually happened. No, a log file would tell you if it's a, if it's an application error. Yeah. But if it's, a, for example, a user experience error where you move your login box from one place to another place, the log files won't tell you that. It's only the, the drop in users will tell you that. Hello. Uh, okay. How do you um, uh, put the deployments on the graph so you can align things like that? Is that part of the system or did you...? So there's a bunch of plugins. Uh, for deployment, for example, we use a, a library called Gra uh, Fabric, <coughs> uh, a Python clone of uh, Capistrano, I think. And it has a plugin. Uh, you just add one line to, to a Fabric deployment script and every time you run deploy, it, just, it, it's, it calls the API of Datadog. And it, like, it has plugins for Jenkins and others, where like, every time something happens, you can just call an API and say, it happened. So it just adds a new uh, time series value. And we ha we, we have, I think we have time for a couple more questions. No questions? Should, like, should we argue more about log files? <laughs> no? Good. Thank you for your time, and like I'll, I'll be around if anyone wants to talk about more of this. And like, thank you.